thanks for joining us this evening for our uh, virtual monthly meeting. Um, our speaker tonight is uh, OFNC member David Seaburn. Um, Dave is uh, currently uh, working for the Canadian Wildlife Federation. He is the freshwater turtle specialist there. And um, in addition to that, Dave has um, been uh, working in herpetology for a very, very long time. And this past year in 2020, he was the uh, recipient of the Blue Racer Award from the Canadian Herpetological Society, um, recognizing uh, his uh, cumulative contributions to uh, reptile and amphibian conservation. Um, he's also been an associate editor for our journal, The Canadian Field Naturalist, since uh, 2011. And uh, uh, he's written a lot of uh, recovery reports, and he's part of the Ontario Multi Species uh, Turtles at Risk Recovery Team, um, and uh, a number of other uh, conservation in initiatives for reptiles and amphibians. So um, uh, we're uh, we're, we're very uh, lucky to have Dave as a, a regular member and uh, regular attendee at OFNC functions. And uh, he's agreed to uh, speak to us tonight about uh, very interesting things uh, in our area. So uh, without further ado, um, please give a, a warm digital welcome to uh, David Zebrin. A lot of muted clapping there, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Jacob. Just let me uh, share the screen here again. Let's see if this works. All right, are we, uh, is it, everyone can, Jacob, can you see the, uh, the slide? Yeah, we are, uh, we are full screen right now. All right, great. All right, um, a couple of uh, confessions before I uh, start the presentation tonight. Um, the first one is I've, I've done a lot of surveys for chorus frogs over the past decade or so off and on. And uh, so I've, but they've all been auditory surveys, listening for frogs. So it's actually very rare for me to see a chorus frog. And I don't think I have ever taken a photograph of a chorus frog. So. Up front, I'm going to confess that every photograph in the presentation is not from me. They have been borrowed from people. Uh, the shot on the on the cover of the, the title screen is from Christine Hanrahan, who's does some amazing photography. Uh, so none of the photographs are, are are from me. As far as I'm concerned, chorus frogs are invisible. They're just a voice. And uh, the second confession I've got to make is that. The talk is called The Mystery of the Declining Chorus Frog. There's going to be a couple of mysteries in the presentation tonight around the different topics about chorus frogs. And I want to be upfront. I'm not going to solve either of those mysteries. So if you're the kind of person that likes questions, you may enjoy the presentation. If you want a solid final answer, then you may be a bit disappointed. It's like you know, missing the last chapter of the Agatha Christie novel, The Mystery of the Declining Chorus Frog. Who killed the frog? Was it Colonel Mustard? Anyways, um, just fair warning that there will be questions, but not a lot of answers. But I'm hoping with the accumulated wisdom that maybe other people will have some ideas that uh, we can discuss about what's going on here. Anyways, off we go. So we're talking about the, the Western chorus frog, or in French, Renette Fulgurion de l'Ouest, and the scientific name Sudacus, Sudacris triceriata. And uh, the species name triceriata is the first kind of diagnostic point. Uh, does my cursor show up on the screen? Good. So triceriata, meaning three lines, basically. And that's one of the key diagnostic things if you actually see a chorus frog is that it has uh, these, oh, my apologies, these distinct lines running down the back. Usually they're long, um, 
uh, solid lines, but occasionally you get these broken lines on the chorus frog back. So this one, you know, if you use a bit of imagination, if you've had a couple of beers, maybe you see three lines, but really I see a lot of spots and a couple of broken lines, but still it's a chorus frog. Either way, it's a very tiny frog. So maximum size is about two and a half centimeters, weighs about one gram, maybe it's 1.5 grams if it's well fed. But we're talking a small frog. Uh, it's part of the tree frog family. So it's closely related to the spring peeper, which probably everyone has heard the beep, beep, beep of, of early spring. So these two species are in the same genus, so they're very closely related. Uh, the spring peepers are pretty good climbers. Uh, chorus frogs, not so much. It is the tree frog family, but they don't really climb trees. Chorus frogs probably get a meter or so off the ground, more apt to be found uh, in long grass or something like that. So they're not, they're not Spider-Man compared to other kinds of tree frogs. So the life cycle of the chorus frog is, is pretty, pretty standard with some strange bits to it in the early spring. And typically this can be when there's still some snow on the ground, the frogs head to the breeding ponds, which are typically temporary wetlands or vernal pools uh, where the males will start to call. And you can see the male here, a vocal sac all puffed out. Uh, amazing photograph, again, not my photograph. And if the technology works, we will hear frogs, the first frogs of the season, hopefully. So the, the call of the chorus, the second frog of the season, there we go. Uh, the call of the chorus frog is often described as a thumbnail running down uh, the teeth of a comb. Uh, I think I'll we'll, we'll play it again, and you think of that. So it's a pretty distinctive call, uh, but some, t oh, some people can't hear it, I guess. Um, anyways, you'll have to uh, go online to find more calls. Um, it's a pretty distinctive call, but we also have the spring peeper, which I mentioned before, which typically does the peep, peep, peep call, but some spring peepers under some conditions will do a bit of a trill. And I managed to find a recording of that. I'm going to see if that works and people can hear it. So we'll see. It'll start off as a peeper call and then change to a trill. So it starts off with a beep, beep, and then. Um, and so some people get confused in the field. Oh, I've got peepers and chorus frogs. And that's been a, been some problem trying to sort out where chorus frogs are and where peepers are because of these peeper trills. A lot of the training materials for people don't mention peeper trills. So if they hear that kind of comb-like sound, they just assume it must be a chorus frog. To my ears, the chorus frog is a very metallic trill. It sounds like it's being made by a machine, whereas the, the spring peeper trill is a bit more musical sounding. And after you hear lots of them, it becomes easier to, to separate, like, like a lot of bird calls. Dave, I have a uh, chorus frog uh, uh, chorus I could play if you want. Pardon me? I have a chorus frog chorus recording I can play right now if sure. you want. Sure. Okay. Is that coming through? High technology sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So anyways, uh, the males are calling and uh, if you find a large chorus of chorus frogs, it is, is extremely loud. The females will come into the sound, uh, find mates, mate. Females will lay a few hundred eggs and those eggs will hatch in a couple of weeks, depending upon the temperature. And then the 
tadpoles will transform in a month or two, again, depending upon the temperature. If it's a warm spring, they transform faster. If it's a cooler spring, it'll take a bit longer. Uh, one of the unusual things about the chorus frog is how fast the entire life cycle is. So uh, the eggs are laid typically around April. You get the tadpoles in a couple of weeks, in a month or two, little baby froglets are out. And by the end of the summer, those little froglets are fully grown and they will breed the next spring. So basically, it's like an annual species in terms of a, like a plant in your garden. Uh, and the space that a chorus frog uses is, is pretty constrained. Uh, typically, they'll stay within 100 meters, maybe 200 meters of that breeding pond. That's the entire world for a chorus frog. So they don't go too far. Um, a neat thing about chorus frogs as well is that uh, because they're breeding in these temporary ponds, those ponds dry up in the summertime. They may not be around in the fall. So chorus frogs actually hibernate on land so they can actually freeze solid um, like wood frogs can do. That's probably a more uh, well-known species that's freeze tolerant. So they will freeze solid uh, come spring. They thaw out, come back to life somehow, and then make their way back to the breeding pond, breed, and then typically die after that. Uh, so basically one year of life. Some may live two years, but for the most part, it's a, it's a one year cycle for the entire species life, which is pretty short. So that's the basic ecology of uh, chorus frogs. If you were to pick up uh, a field guide to amphibians of North America, say a decade ago, and turn to the chorus frog section, you'd see a map something like this. And you don't need to worry about all the different names, but uh, the different shades of gray indicate different species. So down in the south, there's uh, one species of chorus frog, another one over here. Um, in the Midwest, there's the western chorus frog, which gets into Ontario down here. And then in the far west of the United States, in Western Canada, we have the boreal chorus frog. So all these species look very, very similar to each other. Their calls sound very, very similar, at least to our ears. Um, and there's a great deal of debate <clears throat> over are these species, are they subspecies? And it depends whether you're a lumper or a splitter and, and things like that. That was the story up until about a decade ago, and then things got even more complicated. <clears throat> I'm going to take a, a very, very brief digression into genetics. Not my specialty, so it'll be very brief. Uh, as we all know, we get one set of our chromosomes from mom and one set from dad. So we get, you know, mom's nose and dad's ears and, and things like that, right? So we get both sets. That's our nuclear DNA. But we also have mitochondrial DNA inside our bodies. And the mitochondrial DNA is pretty cool in the sense that it's only from your mother. So for example, if your mother's family came from South America and your father's family came from Europe, if we looked at your mitochondrial DNA, it would show this line of mothers, grandmothers, great grandmothers, in South America, and there'd be no fingerprint of Europe in your mitochondrial DNA because dad doesn't matter for the mitochondrial DNA. What does this have to do with chorus frogs? Well, about a decade ago, this uh, ambitious young woman did her PhD on all the chorus frogs in North America. This is a very, very busy map and you can ignore all the points on the map, but just pay attention to the bright colors. That's easy enough to do. And what she found was, according to the mitochondrial DNA, down in the Southern United States, there were a whole bunch of different kinds of chorus frogs. Each color is a different species. But Western Canada, straight, conservative, just one species. Uh, but you can see it's a little messier here in Ontario. So let's zoom into there. So according to her research her, on the mitochondrial DNA, it, she says we have Western chorus frogs 
in southwestern Ontario. So basically south of Toronto. And then north and east of that, so central Ontario, eastern Ontario, western Quebec, we've got boreal chorus rocks. Well, that's a big surprise because we didn't think that. But I gotta keep in mind, this is what the mitochondrial DNA says. And it just basically tells us what mom and grandmothers and grandmothers showed. So this is a, a mystery and it's still going on. So uh, currently there's a professor at Queens University and his lab is looking at the nuclear DNA of chorus frogs in Canada. And they looked at the mitochondrial DNA and they found something very, very similar to what uh, Emily Moriarty Lemon found in terms of the two mitochondrial lineages. But when they looked at the nuclear DNA, all the chorus frogs in Southern Ontario, so in this area here, all Western chorus frogs. So we're not really sure what we've got. Maybe they are all the same Western chorus frogs, or maybe they're two different lineages of Western chorus frogs. Um, Steve Lahey, the professor has said that it's possible there was some kind of hybridization event a few thousand years ago. And for some reason, all the chorus frogs east of Toronto have this mitochondrial lineage. He says, we have no idea. It's, it's an ongoing story, ongoing mystery. And uh, it's maybe 10 years from now, we'll know more about what's going on, but it's, it's very complicated and um, I think we often think that species should be very clear cut. That's an American robin, that's a cardinal, and that's all there is to it. But just because it's messy and complicated for us to see differences between two different groups, there's no reason they can't be messy. I mean, species don't have to have very hard boundaries. In any case, I will continue to call this the Western chorus frog um, just because that's still widely used and it may well be the Western chorus frog. So despite whatever chorus frog it is, we do know that it's declined quite a bit. It was once very common around Montreal and it's now almost absent from that area. Uh, other declines have been found in Western Quebec uh, in northern New York State, uh, but not western New York State. Weird stuff. And the federal government assessed the status of the chorus frog um, basically in eastern Ontario and western Quebec and declared it to be a species at risk. It was listed as being threatened. So in fact, it is the only amphibian in eastern Ontario that is listed as a threatened species by the federal government. I'm not, oops. Those frogs, they just can't wait for spring. Um, so regardless, uh, maybe we shouldn't be happy that we have this threatened species, but we do. And uh, it, it, it's worthwhile to figure out what's going on in our landscape near, near our place. <coughs> So here's a map showing the approximate current distribution of chorus frogs in southern Quebec. And you can see these little speckles of red around Gatineau, uh, close to Montreal, but not too close. Whereas historically, there would have been just hundreds and hundreds of chorus frog sites in these areas. So something has, has, has changed. Certainly urban development's a factor, but there seems to be more than just that. So the obvious question is, if it's not doing so well on the Quebec side, how's it doing on the Ottawa side of the river? So I've been doing a lot of surveys for chorus frogs and this, this is Western Ottawa, just so um, everyone can get oriented here, with this aerial image. So this is kind of urban Ottawa down here, Kanata, you know, the 417 heading out here. here we've got Highway 7, um, you know, this is the Ottawa River, Constance Creek, up here to Constance Bay, and this is Dwyer Hill Road. Hopefully that gives you a good sense of, of the landscape. 
So here, every yellow dot represents a population that's been documented in the last two or three years. Not every site gets surveyed every year. And you can see there are lots of yellow dots and lots of spaces that don't have yellow dots. So, you know, oddly enough, the areas where there's a lot of intensive agriculture, cropland, cornfields, you don't find chorus frogs. That's not a big surprise, probably. But over, overall, doing pretty well in the Ottawa area. Um, I want to give a, just a bit of a description about how I survey and how other people survey for chorus frogs, since that's kind of important, because I said it's all auditory surveys. A lot of this is private land. In fact, most of it's private land. So um, the preferred method is to drive back roads, look for roadside wetlands, stop at the roadside, get out of your car and, and listen. And the call of the chorus frog, especially if there's a good population calling, uh, can travel two, maybe 300 meters. So you can hear them calling from a good distance from the road. And I typically do my surveys in the daytime um, chorus frogs are unusual in that they call during the day as well as at night. So you can do it at night, and there's some evidence that they call more at night than during the daytime. <clears throat> but the benefit of the daytime, of course, is you can see the habitat, and you can stop and say, ah, there's a good looking wetland, I'm going to stop and listen here. And you can then take notes on the habitat and, and what's going on in the landscape. So that's my preferred method. Uh, Fred Schuler, who many of you know, always says he prefers doing it at night. You can hear other species as well. Um, and <clears throat> no question, uh, sometimes chorus frogs don't call during the day, but in general, I found it's been a very successful method. And I'd say 90% of the dots on this map are from daytime surveys. Okay, so Western Ottawa, chorus frogs are doing pretty good. So I'm gonna switch attention for most of the rest of the talk to areas east of Ottawa. And uh, some key names to remember for uh, discussion purposes, Russell that will come up a lot and Cornwall. So here we are in Ottawa, Russell not too far away and you know, Cornwall a bit further away. We're gonna be talking about this landscape between Ottawa and Cornwall. So as a chorus frog researcher in my spare time, I'm extremely lucky to have had a survey conducted by Anne and Garnett Haynes around 1960, which is now, of course, 60 years ago. Uh, so that's a long time ago. It's longer than I've been around. Uh, but they did some surveys for spring calling frogs. And... Uh, uh, through a mutual friend, who was the late Francis Cook, I got their data, was able to map their data, and these the black dots on the map represent where they heard chorus frogs around 1960. Now, I think we can all agree there's been some changes to Ottawa since 1960, you know, besides the pandemic, roads, houses, highways, you know, a lot of changes, no question. But the important thing is, we have this good baseline to know that chorus frogs were widespread in eastern Ottawa, so like here's Mary Blue Blog area, and, and, and to the east of Ottawa. So fantastic. So back in 2011, which is now a decade ago, I did some very intensive surveys for chorus frogs to see how they were doing at that time. So in this map, uh, the white circles indicate spots where I stopped, I listened, but I did not detect chorus frogs. And the black circles represent spots where I did hear chorus frogs. We always have to be you know, careful to say that just because I didn't hear them doesn't mean they're not there because they might have just not been calling that day or that hour. Uh, but as you can see, I uh, stopped and listened at a lot of ponds over two years. It was 184 sites and only heard chorus frogs at five sites. This was quite the surprise, um, more like a shock, I guess. And I don't think I would, would have even found these sites, but Fred Schuler happened to be visiting someone in Russell, heard chorus frogs, alerted me, 
And I did a few more surveys and found a few more sites around that area. So I, I, I surveyed some of the sites in both years, 2011 and 2012, just to do a check on what the benefit was of going back for the second year. And I surveyed 48 sites twice. And of those 48 sites, uh, none of them had chorus frogs in year one. And in year two, one of them I heard chorus frogs at. So even doing a second survey didn't really improve the data. And it still only gave us chorus frogs um, in the Russell area, which is some strange spot that's still good for chorus frogs. Well, I'm just gonna rush ahead to 2018. I didn't always do chorus frog surveys east of Ottawa. Uh, I did a few and over the years, added a few more spots to the map. So we can see we've got our spots around Russell, uh, just to the west of Russell. Uh, again, Fred Schuler found this spot uh, just north of Winchester. And then there's a few sites uh, south of Avonmore, if that means anything to you, or kind of northwest of Cornwall. But for the most part, you can see the map is pretty empty of chorus frogs. So in 20, after the 2018 season decided there had to be some way of systematically finding uh, the sweet spots where chorus frogs might be present. And uh, we managed to get some funding from the Canadian Wildlife Service, the federal government uh, for chorus frog because they are a threatened species. And uh, we developed a, a survey plan because doing all these surveys, you start seeing patterns. And the obvious pattern in my mind had always been, uh, I hear chorus frogs close to roads because I'm doing surveys along roads, that's fine. There typically would be a fair amount of tree cover and there would typically be wetland habitat. So it makes sense to try to target where the trees and the wetlands coexist. And rather than just driving the roads randomly, plan ahead. So I used a geographic information system and then put in the aerial imagery, which is the photograph you see in this image. So you can see high tree cover in certain areas, cropland around it. And then I added in the official wetland layer produced by the provincial government. And that's the light blue stuff. So you can kind of see that it's textured under the blue and that's just indicating it's forest cover with the wetland layer on top. So it's, it really probably is a flooded swamp or a flooded forest. Is it just a damp forest or a swamp? Gradations there probably isn't a lot of water, but it's being classed as wetland. And if it's wet, saturated soils, you may get these small temporary ponds that chorus frogs like. So we identified a whole bunch of these sites where the habitat looked really good and then uh, in 2019, set out to survey at these sites. And I think we had pretty good success. So in total, uh, we surveyed 89 sites east of Ottawa that were part of this uh, habitat mapping project and found uh, eight sites that had no previous records of chorus frogs. They probably aren't new populations, they're just unknown populations. Um, so five of the eight sites were within two kilometers of known sites. So, you know, it's good to find those. That's a, it's a good sign there's more populations in the area, but might have found those sites just by kind of randomly driving around the area of known locations. But I was more excited by the fact that we had found three new sites that were five to 10 kilometers away from known sites. And those might not have been found otherwise. So that's very exciting. And it opens up uh, you know, more patches of habitat that seem to have chorus frogs. So as a reminder, uh, the chorus frog map looked something like this in 2018. And uh, you wanna keep your eye in this area for the big change. So in 2019, boom, we added a couple little spots over here, but they were close to a known spot, but we added these locations in here. 
So all of a sudden, I won't say there's lots, but there's a bigger area that seems to have chorus frog observations. So this is interesting. And again, if you look at this map, um, especially zoomed out to this scale, you can see all the chorus frog locations seem to be in areas with dark green, where you've got the tree cover as opposed to um, whereas the open areas that are mainly cropland. So I'm going to zoom in to some of those locations just so we can have a, a closer examination of them. So first of all, the Russell area, uh, a very inhospitable looking habitat. You can see it's surrounded by cropland in all directions, but it's almost like it's this little island of green and you've got these chorus frog sites around the edge of the island. And that's of course where the roads are. Uh, it's an interesting story about how it can persevere in such a small patch. You can see the scale bar down here, two kilometers across. This is a really small area, and yet somehow they have persevered there, presumably for decades, maybe, maybe hundreds of years. This is just to the west of Russell, um, cropland to the east, but you can see more natural habitat um, over here. And um, there are houses in here, but there's chorus frogs calling from these little flooded areas behind the houses. So again, they persist in a, a disturbed landscape, but there's just enough habitat for them to, to make it. This is one of the strangest sites I found. Typically, um, as I said, the, the sites have all been wetlands right next to roads. Uh, but here was a road with pasture or old field on one side of the road and a cornfield on the other. And I decided there was no point continuing the survey here. So I turned the car around, just happened to have the windows rolled down. And in, in turning the car around, basically the car came to a stop. And off in the distance, I could hear this very faint sound, which I was not quite sure was a chorus frog, but I thought it was. So I stopped the car and turned off the key, got out of the car and, you know, cupped my hands around my ears and stood there for a long time. And finally, it was very, very clear that there were chorus frogs calling from someplace back here in the woods. So this is interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it shows us that we can hear frogs from quite a distance from the road, probably a couple hundred meters. And also, maybe chorus frogs are sometimes persisting in these treed areas. We associate them with open areas, but there may be some open habitat in here that's just too small to show up in the aerial imagery, but it's big enough for the chorus frogs. Or you know, maybe it's a, an open patch to the side here that we can't really see, but it's probably somewhere in here. So um, we can find the chorus frogs if they're calling, which is a benefit over, you know, species like snails and things like that are much harder to survey for. But I don't want to make you think that chorus frogs are common. So this is kind of a, a summary map showing the survey effort 2018, 2019, uh, in the Cornwall area. So the, the red circles indicate, again, um, either myself or in 2019, I think it was Fred surveyed this area. Um, red spots, no chorus frogs. Yellow spots, chorus frogs were heard. So I expect there are more spots with chorus frogs in these areas, but it's going to take a lot of work to find sites a kilometer away from known spots. But uh, it's kind of the next step and the mystery is figuring out where they still are. And again, just to flip back very, very briefly to West Ottawa, <clears throat> chorus frogs, really pretty widespread on this landscape, despite the fact that there's these sections of uh, cropland with no chorus frogs. So we have to ask ourselves, why are chorus frogs doing so well West Ottawa, but doing so poorly east of Ottawa. What's the difference? So 
it's not surprising that the chorus frogs are gone from areas that are completely cropland. And we've seen like areas around Russell, they can persist if there's wetlands and some tree cover, even surrounded by cropland. But we've also seen lots of areas that seem to be ideal habitat, wetlands, tree cover, but they're gone. So this is back looking at the area west of Cornwall, kind of zoomed into just part of it. And again, uh, the light blue indicates wetlands. So you can see you've got a chorus frog population here, over here, and up here, but lots and lots of wetland habitat. So we can't say, oh, well, they're gone because there's just no wetlands left east of Winchester. That's clearly not the case. There's lots of wetlands. And there is forest cover in these areas too. So why are the chorus frogs so rare? So when we're talking about a species like the chorus frog, which is, an, like I said before, an annual species, lives, dies one year, uh, it's often better to talk about a metapopulation as opposed to an individual population. And a metapopulation is just a fancy word for saying a, a group of populations. So for example, we can imagine that this green rectangle on the screen is a landscape. There's a whole bunch of little temporary ponds and they have chorus frogs in them. So year after year, the chorus frogs breed in their ponds. They're happy. The ponds dry up in the summertime. Everything's just fine. But we can also imagine that uh, one year, there's very little rain in the springtime and the pond dries up earlier than usual before the tadpoles have a chance to transform and that that wipes out all the chorus frogs from that site there's none left and maybe for a year or two there'll be no chorus frogs at that site but because the pond the empty pond is now surrounded by other chorus frog sites eventually there'll be chorus frogs that disperse out from those other ponds across the landscape, moving that 100 or 200 meters, maybe even 300 meters if it's bold, and recolonize that pond. So we're back to the state of having a whole bunch of ponds. So in a, a meta population, any individual pond, any individual population isn't going to be stable in the long term. It's got a high probability of going extinct, of being wiped out. But because it's got neighbors, chorus frogs will recolonize it. And so the overall group of populations, the meta population, would be stable. And now we can also imagine that uh, human beings have changed the landscape in the last 200 years. So, what happens when we add humans and our actions to the landscape? Well, it's a good chance that we might get rid of some of these temporary wetlands. They're just low-lying areas, so maybe they get filled in, uh, maybe they get planted for a garden, maybe it becomes covered with shrubs and no longer is a little temporary pond, but is really more of a forest or a shrubland. So we have fewer wetlands on the landscape. And if you reduce the number of wetlands, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to start increasing the distance between wetlands. And that's going to make it just a little bit harder for frogs to move from one pond to another. And we can also imagine a road being built. And so now we're left with this chorus frog pond on the one side of the road. And it's happy for a few years. And then, of course, that drought comes along. The pond dries up too early. Tadpoles all die. All the chorus frogs are gone. But now the nearest neighboring ponds are across this road. And it's a good distance away. And so all of a sudden, it's too far and too difficult for a chorus frog to get from here to this pond. So now this pond may 
no longer have chorus frogs in it for the next decade, maybe the next two or three decades. It's impossible to get recolonized. And we can imagine as more and more ponds become isolated, as the ponds actually become islands, that once something bad happens, if you get a really bad drought, it could knock out a whole bunch of chorus frog populations, and those ponds can no longer get recolonized. So it's possible that that's what's going on in the landscape. I don't know that that's what's going on. And if it is what's going on, why isn't it happening in West Ottawa? Now, there could be differences in wetland structure or wetland patterns. And this is a hard thing to analyze because the, the small ponds that chorus frogs like are typically the hardest ones to um, to inventory through aerial imagery and things like that. So anyways, it's a bit of a mystery. I think loss of temporary wetlands is probably a factor for a chorus frog decline east of Ottawa, but I don't know for sure. So that's, that's the big mystery in my mind and it has been for 20 years now, I guess. So that's kind of the end of the mystery of the chorus frogs. The, uh, the final chapter is just kind of wrapping up some loose ends here. And of course, uh, if you're a naturalist or a biologist, you're often asked the question, well, why should I care about this little frog anyways? Or this little bird or this little plant? What does it matter if the Western chorus frog disappears? You know, it's small, you, you rarely see it, so what? Um, you know, as naturalists, I think we all have the attitude that, well, it's a unique species or species complex, whatever it is, it has a right to exist. And uh, that's probably an answer that's good enough for, for most of us. Uh, but it's also good to have other answers for people. And uh, I always like to say that frogs are beneficial because they eat insects and mosquitoes and things that people may not like. So there's some great graphics out there. If frogs go extinct, you'll notice. So. Another reason to care about frogs is that they're beneficial for, for us and perhaps for the ecosystem services. And I think there's one more reason uh, why chorus frogs are important and this whole mystery of the declining chorus frogs is important. And that's the whole concept about temporary ponds or vernal pools. So I don't really like the term temporary pond. I think it has too many negative connotations to it. This is a pond, but no, it's not a pond. It's a temporary pond. It's not a real pond. It's only a pond for a few weeks in the springtime. And I think, I think that word temporary can make a lot of people think it's an unimportant pond. So, you know, I'd say it's always a temporary pond. It's just that sometimes it has water and sometimes it doesn't. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a butterfly. You've got a caterpillar and it turns into a butterfly. The caterpillar and the butterfly are really the same thing, but they're two different states, right? So um, I use the term temporary ponds sometimes, but I really do prefer the term vernal pools, woodland pools, Woodland ponds, I think those are, are, are better words to make it sound like it's not just something temporary. It's only here for today and gone tomorrow. And if, if my theory about metapopulations and ponds disappearing and, and things like that are true, then really the mystery and the decline is not the decline of the chorus frog, it's really the decline of the vernal pools. And so if they're becoming rarer and rarer on the landscape, we're losing the other species that are inside these ponds. And they could be snails, they could be other aquatic insects or plants that need the damp soil. Um, there's salamanders that may be breeding in these ponds. So I think Chorus frogs may be one of these uh, indicator species of temporary ponds or, or vernal pools. And that's an important thing to think about the conservation of these vernal pools. 
All right, so what can we do to try to help chorus frogs? So um, as I've been doing for years, doing surveys, try to find more sites. Because if you don't know where they are, you can't really do much for this species. And uh, I encourage anyone who's out there in the springtime, if they hear chorus frogs, um, if you have your smartphone or some kind of smartphone and you have iNaturalist on your phone, you can actually record the calling of the chorus frog and then upload that to iNaturalist. And then someone else can come along and listen to the recording and say, yes, that is definitely a chorus frog. That is not a peeper trail and confirm your observation. And that's, that's a fantastic tool we've got these days. So find, find out where they're breeding, find out the remaining unknown chorus frog sites and figuring out ways to protect those breeding sites because they're not majestic swamps and marshes. They are temporary pools, which just don't get the same respect. And I think probably um, if I'm right, we're gonna have to create more of these vernal pools. Because if we have more of those pools, the chorus frogs have more breeding sites <clears throat> within a small area. And then that overall population is gonna be more stable and they're gonna likely survive in the long term. So it's actually not that hard to create temporary ponds. I know the Nature Conservancy of Canada has actually been doing that on the Quebec side of the border. They've been finding out where chorus frogs are and then working with landowners, creating two or three small ponds nearby just to create this extra number of breeding sites for the frogs. It's a fantastic idea. So there we go. Find where they're breeding, protect those sites, and then create more breeding habitat. And that will benefit the chorus frogs as well as other species. Last but not least, a few thank yous. And the first thank you has to go to the OFNC. Uh, the research fund has funded me for a couple of years. They provided gas money to bomb around uh, Russell and Cornwall looking for chorus frog populations. So thank you very much for that funding support. And I need to thank my employer, the Canadian Wildlife Federation, who's allowed me to spend some of my days in the springtime driving around hunting for chorus frogs. And I need to thank a large number of people who have helped with chorus frog surveys, who have helped with data entry, data analysis, mapping, and just uh, all kinds of conversations about chorus frog biology and conservation and metapopulations and things like that. Um, uh, this is never a one person job and I could not have done it without all these wonderful people that have helped me. So thank you very much. You've been a very quiet audience, ha ha ha. Um, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, that was excellent. Um, we have a couple of questions in the comments already. Um, are there chorus frogs at Mare Bleu? I can never say no, but I have never heard them there. And um, there are a couple of historical records from Mare Blue. So I've been there a few times walking the boardwalk um, and have never heard them. So as far as I know, they're not currently there. But if anyone hears them, please let me know. And, uh, oh, and then I guess the other thing was a, a com and just a comment in Canada, there's a pond in Young's Pond Park. And uh, Elizabeth says she hears frogs there all uh, all June and July, and she'll record the sound and share it because she doesn't know what type of frog it is. Um, okay. If it's is June and July, it won't be chorus frogs. I probably didn't emphasize that, but around here, uh, chorus frogs will start calling as early as late March if it's a warm spring, but typically it's April, two or three weeks in April, maybe going to the end of April, and the, the nighttime calling might go into early May. If it's uh, if it's June or July, green frogs are the most likely, maybe bullfrogs. Yeah. Um, is there a, a place where you'd like people to 
put recordings if they have them? Is it helpful if people put the recordings on iNaturalist, for example? Yeah, iNaturalist is, is the best place. If you can, if you if you're already on iNat, it's easy to upload and uh, uh, doesn't have to be me that looks or listens to the recording. Um, if you email it to me, there's always file formats and problems and uh, it, I, I probably won't get around to listening to it for quite some time. Perfect. Um, Eric would like says, uh, can you speak to the legislative protection regarding Western chorus frog, particularly the fact they're not a species at risk provincially, but that they are federally? Does this mean their habitat is only protected in federally owned lands? Yeah, it, this does get very complicated very quickly. Um, so you've, you've described it quite well. It does have federal protection under SARA, the Species at Risk Act. Um, there has been a court case in Quebec over the chorus frog on private land. And the federal government actually took the developer to court and they won. It was upheld. So this was an application of federal law in the province of Quebec, which you know politically is always perhaps a bit more sensitive for the feds to stomp on the province of Quebec about something. Uh, so it's possible for the feds to intervene on private land in Ontario. I think it's unlikely just because chorus frogs are more widespread. As we go further and further west of Ottawa, chorus frogs become more and more common. And that's why they're not a provincially at risk. There are really only rare kind of east of Ottawa, as you may have seen from tonight's presentation. So yes, that's, that's a big issue. Developers can just say, you know, you could be in the Cornwall area, have one of the sites that has chorus frogs and decide just to to bulldoze it and, and put in whatever, a cornfield or a house. And it's very unlikely there'd be any um, political will to stop you. That is, is definitely a challenge. But at the same time, to, to flip things around, because it is a federally listed species, it does mean there's money for conservation actions. So it would be possible to work with landowners and say, hey, maybe we could figure out a way to protect this small little pond. And what about if this land trust or this conservation organization wants to create another small pond on your property? And you know, there's no loss to you if you don't need that habitat. Maybe you can get a tax break on your federal taxes for it. So it's not a complete loss loss. But there's no question provincially, um, there will be no protection for chorus frogs in Ontario. Okay. Um, I think you covered this already. Uh, Jonathan asks, uh, when in spring should I go to hear the frogs? Yeah, so it is definitely the month of April is peak. Uh, during the daytime, I feel like 10 degrees centigrade is about the cutoff point. And if it's not too windy. So if it's a very windy day and 11 degrees, I would stay home. But if it's 10 degrees, maybe a bit of sunshine and uh, very light breeze, that's, that's pretty good circumstances for chorus frogs. And um, especially if there's been more than one or two days that have hit that, the first day it hits plus 10 may not be enough, but uh, certainly after two or three days above 10 degrees, it'll start being uh, chorus frog season. And if you're on uh, Facebook or one of these groups, quite often people start, you know, posting the first birds of spring and the first calling frogs of spring. And the chorus frog is really one of the first frogs that starts to call. So as soon as you hear someone saying, I've heard frogs calling in the Ottawa area, you know, chorus frog season is either has already begun or is about to begin in a couple of days. Great. Um, West Amanda say uh, we have a, a vernal pool in the small wood across from our house. Uh, they live near train yards. Are they unlikely to hear chorus frogs? Uh, so remind me, train yards is kind of like East Ottawa, like or East, East Ottawa? 
like uh, between uh, Riverside and Saint Laurent Industrial kind of area. Right. Uh, probably not. I, I'm not sure. I've heard any chorus frogs in what I would call urban Ottawa. Uh, I've heard them around the edge of Stittsville, but it's always really at the edge where on one side of the road, it's a subdivision and the other side, it's still forest and marsh. So unless you've got uh, a fair amount of habitat that's natural looking, it's unlikely to have chorus frogs inside the, the city of Ottawa or the, the urban part of the city. Um, Owen uh, has a comment. He says that he grew up in the North Russell population of chorus frogs. <laughs> they were there in the early 1980s, as early as he can remember. And anecdotally, he remembers them being a lot louder at night than in the day. <laughs> His hearing was better back then. <laughs> uh, it um, wouldn't surprise me that they were more common and things have changed. Uh, Anne asks, can tadpoles be moved from one pond to another to help them populate another pond? Oh, good question. Um, so, because they are a federally threatened species, to do so would require some kind of federal permit, I think, even if it's not on federal land. Hmm, I think that's the case. I'm, I'm not positive with that legal question. Um, so aside from that issue, it would be possible, but you'd have to make sure that they were going to a good site as opposed to a bad site. And uh, that's not always intuitive, even after I've seen lots and lots of chorus frog sites. And of course, if you only took 50 tadpoles, the odds of them surviving and forming a breeding population is pretty low. So you'd probably have to move quite a few tadpoles, which might harm the population you took it from. So I, I wouldn't do it lightly. I wouldn't do it at all personally. I think I, I would much rather see an additional pond created nearby the current pond because that likely will you know, create a, a new quote unquote population and, and those sites will be, will be more stable. If you just move it to one pond, the odds of it succeeding are, are low. It can happen, but I, I think it's low and unless they could colonize other ponds nearby, there's a good chance it, even if it succeeds, it'll only succeed for a few years and then a bad year occurs and it gets wiped out again. But uh, I think on a larger scale, it certainly is possible if uh, it has to be well planned out and the habitat would be well, well mapped out to have a good sense that it's going to work. And it might take multiple reintroductions uh, and maybe to two or three ponds that are all close together. So you've got this group of populations. But good question. And uh, it's kind of related to uh, speaking to pond quality. Uh, Susan's asking, um, how long does a vernal pool need to persist into the season for chorus frogs? So every question for amphibians and reptiles always comes back to, it depends, and it depends on the temperature, um, which of course is gonna affect the, uh, how long the water stays in the pond. So the, the eggs take a couple of weeks to hatch out and then the tadpoles will transform in one to two months. So if breeding happens middle of April, uh, tadpoles are hatched out by May 1st, we'll say, and then two months, that's all of May, all of June, and then it doesn't matter if the pond dries up. And probably if the pond dries up in the middle of June, it's going to be hotter and that might speed up some transformation. So probably middle of June, something like that. And, and there's some speculation that with climate change, we're seeing things like um, more rapid drying of ponds in the springtime. And so that could be another factor that uh, 
uh, as hitting species that depend upon these vernal pools. Um, if that were the case in the Ottawa area, you would think it would affect West Ottawa as well as East of Ottawa. So I don't think climate change is the, the biggest factor, but certainly anything which is changing um, how long the ponds persist certainly could. So for example, if there's more tile drainage and areas surrounding your brooding pools, that could mean the soil's not as saturated, the pond might not be quite as full, and it may dry up faster. Okay. Um, can you suggest an app for sound recording if someone's recording calls? Uh, sorry, an app to record them? Yeah. So if you have a smartphone, uh, it's built right into your smartphone if you use iNaturalist. You do not need a separate uh, app or anything besides that. For a long time, iNaturalist just had photos, but about a year or two ago, they added um, a sound function. So it, it just comes up on the app when you open iNaturalist. You can take a sound recording or take a photograph and it records it and stores it and puts the date on it and the location. It makes everything so much simpler. So that's the easiest way all you got to do is download an app to your smartphone. And if you're old school like me, I have a smartphone, but I don't even have a data plan on my, on my phone because I'm too cheap. Um, you don't need to have data in the field. Um, you can be in the field at your site. You record the observation. When you come back home, you get on Wi-Fi and upload the observation to iNaturalist. So all you need is a, an old smartphone and you're, you're, you're away. Alternatively, you can use any kind of digital recorder and then figure out a way to transfer it to your computer and then upload it, but that sounds complicated. Um, easier question now. Uh, the, are the peeper and chorus frog seasons similar at similar times of year? Is that why you confuse the trills? Yeah, so the, the spring peepers start calling around the same time as chorus frogs. It can vary, you know, who's first from year to year. Um, the big difference is that the chorus frogs at a given site will call for two, maybe three weeks. It's a pretty short breeding season, whereas the, the spring peeper males have got more endurance. They just keep going and they may call for a month or maybe more than that. I don't know why. I'm sure the females are long gone but those male spring peepers just keep on calling. So it's a longer calling season for the peepers, but it does overlap completely with the chorus frogs. Um, okay. Uh, oh, Fred Schuler's got a note for us. Uh, he oh, says, Francis, Francis Cook started a population in a new pond on his land with one female and a few males. <laughs> It sounds like those would have been adult frogs, not tadpoles. Yeah. Well, Adam and Eve, right? <laughs> Even multiple atoms, I guess. Multiple <laughs> atoms. Well, probably just one lucky atom. Um, but I mean, a female can lay a few hundred eggs. So that's a good way to move a lot of tadpoles into the pond is to get them before their tadpoles. Um, so if I recall, I think it lasted for a few years, but I don't think the pond uh, persisted for more than a decade, but I don't remember offhand. Yeah, so like you were saying, you'd want uh, higher quality habitat in multiple ponds in, in this theoretical scenario. Mm -hmm. But that probably would be the better way to do a, an introduction is to, in the spring or summertime after the, the, after the froglets have left the pond, catch a whole bunch of chorus frogs and move them to a, a new pond and they would probably stay there and they would breed there the next year if it was a good habitat. Um, all right, and then uh, let's see. Um, uh, someone's asking, do they die in ditches near salted roads? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, there's been some research on the effects of salt on amphibians in general. And for the most part, it's not good. Um, 
there's been, I think, some research that showed it, it affects hatching success of the eggs. So if, if the pond has a high salt content from road salt, it can either uh, kill eggs or delay the hatching. Um, and it can reduce the survival of the tadpoles. And certainly if it's very, very high and the frogs are hanging out in the ditch, uh, it, would, it could be lethal to the, the frogs as well. There's also been some research um, just in the broader category of chemical contaminants, um, high levels of fertilizer, if they go into the breeding ponds, can cause mortality to the tadpoles. I think it was uh, high levels of nitrates, but it has to be very high, it can cause mortality. <clears throat> and there's been at least some uh, some herbicides which have been shown to either affect development or kill the frogs. And this may be uh, the active ingredient in the herbicide, but it's probably more likely uh, what's called the surfactant. So a lot of these pesticides or herbicides have something added to it, which helps the chemical bond with the surface of the leaves it's being sprayed on. And um, that basically can interfere with the skin's respiration in, in amphibians. Uh, so that can be, can be lethal to the frogs. I don't think that's a huge threat just because um, most of the chorus frog sites I've seen have been quite some distance from cornfields. There was that one shot I showed of a, a cornfield and then the chorus frogs calling in the woods. Um, but I think even a, a small buffer of woods would protect them from most of the pesticides and, and runoff. But chemicals certainly are a potential threat, and, but that should be across our landscape in, in West Ottawa as well as East of Ottawa. Yes. Um, and then uh, Eric had a note. Uh, he just said uh, the consultants, Blazing Star Environmental, are doing a multi year study. Um, using citizen science volunteers to survey. And he said he participated last year and found several populations around Metcalf. Oh, excellent, Metcalf, cool. That's very exciting. Um, yes, Blazing Star is doing some great work. They're working with uh, Environment Canada, trying to get a better sense of are the populations of chorus frogs stable or going down and they're measuring uh, or monitoring I think pretty much from Toronto to Ottawa, so or east of Ottawa. So it's a pretty big undertaking and uh, that, that's a great thing to get involved with. I will try to post the notice to the OFNC Facebook group tomorrow, if I think of it, but they're looking for volunteers and it's, it is straightforward. You listen and write down what you, what you heard. All right. Um, I think a lot of questions. Uh, if I missed anybody's questions here in the uh, comments, I apologize. Um, uh, a lot of people here are saying thank you, though, for an informative presentation, and uh, I'll, I'll echo that. Um, so, when you may know, uh, Patrick Molduan is saying uh, thanks very much for your presentation, Dave. It's humbling that we still have a lot to learn about these charismatic little frogs. And uh, Many like comments. So thank you very much again, Dave, for for um, uh, for speaking to us tonight and giving us a presentation to uh, to to watch while we are all staying at home. So, no, my pleasure. We just have to think that you know, in a month or two, it's going to be spring and the birds are back and the frogs will be calling. So this is just kind of a, an early spring, right? <laughs> exactly. All right. David, right. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And uh, we'll see you at another OFNC event in the future. Thank you, David. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. David.